Good morning and welcome everybody to MPW London's A-Level English Literature Sample Class. Uh, your teacher for today is Mr Richard Martin. We have quite a few of you signed up for this morning's session. Um, so just to make you aware that um, normally daily lessons MPW consists of about eight or ten students per class. Um, but we do hope that you find this session both informative uh, and enjoyable. Um, so yes, I'll hand over now to uh, Mr Richard Martin and uh, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know whether the good luck is uh, uh, in relationship <laughs> to me or the students, uh, but anyway, perhaps both. Uh, <laughs> uh, so well, welcome everyone. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm, as, as, as you've just been reminded, uh, you know, we don't tend to teach more than about um, nine. Uh, really uh, at MPW so that this is uh, this may be a bit more challenging but I'd, I'd hoped that you've been sent some uh, some material because I thought a really nice way of proceeding uh, so that you could sense both the text that we do and the kind of level uh, that we go into would be just to look at some um, some you know, sections from the texts uh, there's two that we're not going to look at and I'll, I'll one of them isn't referred to on the um, on the uh, on the document, so I'll just I'll just remind you of that. Uh, students at A level do twenty percent coursework, which is a really good way of uh, getting you know full marks, uh, because you know if you're if you've got a hands on approach on the part of your tutor and you treat the subject seriously, it is very very possible to get you know full marks. And um, this year I'm going to be looking at the homecoming which is one of the sections that I've put in the document, though whether we'll make, get time to look at it, I don't know. Uh, but we're going to compare that to a novel called Jack's Return Home. Uh, and Jack's Return Home was filmed as Get Carter, uh, a very famous movie from 1971. And the other thing we're going to do, which I haven't included in uh, the sample lesson, is we're going to be looking at some poems written in 2012 uh, called Which... Uh, they're poems about the witch trials that took place in the mid 17th century, and they look at the witch trials from different perspectives, from the perspectives of the, the young woman accused of witchcraft, from the perspective of the people who think that she's guilty of witchcraft. And um, I've made contact with the poet, and he's going to come in to talk to us. So um, uh, viruses permitting, uh, we'll be able to meet with the poet, and he can talk us through what you know, he intended to achieve. So uh, I hope that's an exciting idea in itself. But what I thought I'd do is we'd, um, you know, just look at some significant passages uh, in uh, some of the texts we're doing. I've, I've kept them short, and I'm just going to get up on screen and hope you can see it. Uh, just, just where is it? There you are. There you are. That should be coming up on screen. It's the document that you were sent uh, yesterday. Okay. Can everyone, can everyone see that document? Yeah? Can yeah, everyone, no. can everyone uh, see? Yes, that's better. Is it coming up? Yes, now we can see. Fantastic. That's great. So I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at this uh, overnight. I mean, I mean, I'm, I don't, don't worry if you didn't. Uh, but what I thought would be quite useful would be just uh, that we're, we're going to be looking at Dracula. In second term, we've got the luxury of doing a whole term on Gothic literature. And that means two things. It means, or rather three things. It means that we'll be comparing Dracula by Bram Stoker to The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. Angela Carter's writing in 1979. Uh, she's a feminist and her fairy tales reflect a feminist perspective, as we'll see in a moment. Um, this is the very famous novel by Bram Stoker, uh, Dracula from 1897. And I'd, I thought it'd be rather interesting to look at the passage where Jonathan Harker, who's an Exeter solicitor, uh, he's come to Transylvania to meet with a client. He's never met uh, Count Dracula before. He knows nothing about Count Dracula. But during the course of his stay uh, with Dracula, uh, he starts to become more and more worried uh, by the nature of his host. So I wonder whether or not you could just, in, the, in a couple of minutes, just read through the passage. I deliberately printed it in red for rather obvious reasons, 
since Dracula is so interested in blood. OK, but I just want you to look at that passage and then I wanted to talk you through some of the things that we would say about it. So if I can just give you, you know, about you know, three or four minutes uh, just to look at the signature, you may you may remember it. it's a very famous moment, isn't it? Even people who've never read the novel uh, know that vampires don't create reflections in mirrors and they apparently don't create shadows. Uh, either okay and this is the sequence that I've selected so just spend a couple of minutes just uh, looking at that uh, perhaps for the first time or the second time uh, in 24 hours and then I'll, I'll talk you through it all right and as I said in my preamble I'd I'd be very happy if anyone wants to contribute I mean obviously we've got quite a lot of people and we can't have a free-for-all but if anybody really feels they've got something that they want to ask or uh, contribute then you know absolutely go for it all right, because that's exactly what it would be like in class, uh, you know, where um, I don't want to be talking all the time, but want to be uh, getting a sense of what you think of the text. So I'm going to give you three minutes to just uh, look at that passage. OK, um, one thing I wanted to raise with you was this, that I think when we're when we're watching films of Dracula or perhaps when we're reading Dracula just for fun or reading other vampire stories, uh, and there's plenty of them around, isn't there? Um, then we're probably just excited by the idea, the uncanny idea that somebody doesn't create a reflection in a mirror. OK, that's probably that's level one, isn't it, really? Uh, we find that exciting, we find it strange, we find it uncanny. Can I suggest to you that, that at A level, we'd be interested in something completely different? We would be interested, and I've highlighted it so you can see, we'd be interested in what he does see in the mirror, not what he doesn't see. I mean, what he doesn't see, I mean, you know, that's great, I love it. But what really interests me is the fact that when Jonathan Harker looks for the vampire he sees himself. And that is a very exciting idea, isn't it? Because it begins to suggest that Bram Stoker might be interested in the vampire within us all. OK, now that's not something, is it, that when we're watching these films, you know, we, 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 we want to demonise the vampire, don't we? We want to see the vampire as a figure of evil. But I suggest to you that the chief subtlety of Bram Stoker's Dracula is the ways in which it asks us to think about the vampire within. OK, and therefore, for me, I really like what I've highlighted there. The whole room behind me was displayed. And there was no sign of a man in it except myself. And that clinches it for me that I should not just be interested in what I can't see. I should also be interested in what I do see and what I see when we go looking for the vampire, if you like, Bram Stoker seems to be telling us we'll find ourselves or we'll find an aspect of ourselves. So that's something that interests me here. Um, uh, I don't, does anyone want to uh, sort of come back to me on that or, or, or would, would you like to press on? Is there, is, there, is there anything else in the passage that you find quite striking? Um, I don't, don't worry if you don't want to talk. I, I'm just... I'm just wanting to offer you the opportunity to do so. Uh, anything, anything else that you liked in the passage? 
I'm entirely happy to to speak on your behalf if you like. I mean, uh, two things that strike me um, that there's a very obvious effect in Gothic writing. And of course, this is what we're going to be studying. And we're going to be looking at lots of passages in Gothic tradition, as well as focusing upon Dracula and the Bloody Chamber. Uh, but what we always need in Gothic writing is a narrator who isn't really believing of the supernatural. Uh, and so Stoker makes that characteristic move in what I've highlighted there. Can you see? I turn to the glass again to see how I'd been mistaken. This time, there could be no error. You see, Gothic literature comes out of the Enlightenment. It comes out of a period in the 18th century uh, when people were becoming very confident that science could explain everything. And of course, you and I still live in that world, you know, a world dominated by science and technology. And maybe that's the reason why Gothic remains, Gothic endures, uh, because it does offer the idea that there might be things that we can't explain. So at the heart of a lot of Gothic writing, we have rational characters. You know, Jonathan Harker, he's a solicitor. He's not very interested in the supernatural. And therefore, there's always this delay in which the character, you know, tries to resist the supernatural because it challenges their worldview. But during the course of a Gothic text, that worldview is going to be adjusted uh, and transformed. And the other thing I wanted to say about uh, this passage is simply the idea of him shaving. Um, it strikes me as being very interesting that Jonathan Harker, in shaving, he's trying to remove the animal quality that he has. I mean, I mean, I shave every morning. I don't consciously think this is I'm shaving. I'm sure you don't either, uh, gentlemen. But uh, when we shave, we are actually trying to eradicate the animal, okay? And therefore, this passage is fascinating, isn't it? Because on the one hand, I've got Jonathan uh, trying to sort of you know, keep keep his appearances up. You know, he's in a new and slightly disturbing situation. So he's keeping up his appearances as a, as a gentleman, as a member of the British Empire. OK, uh, and yet he's confronted by a being who is both human and animal and perhaps exposes the animal quality uh, of humanity. And I think that's something Stoke is very, very uh, interested in pursuing. Um, uh, at A level, we, we talk a lot about context, background, you know, historical uh, context. And of course, some of you will know that Darwin in the mid 19th century in 1859 had published a book called The Origin of the Species, which identifies a link between the human and the animal, you know, identifies the human as coming from the animal rather than being a separate species. And I think we've got to explain Dracula you know, in relationship to that revolutionary and uh, for some people, very, very disturbing uh, idea. OK, so as I say, I've got this lovely juxtaposition, haven't I? You know, Jonathan shaving. You might notice that um, at the end of the passage, um, he's still very troubled uh, by the fact that he may not be able to shave uh, because Dracula's thrown his mirror out of the window. Uh, the passage ends, doesn't it, with him saying it is very annoying for I do not see how I am to shave. So the fact that the passage ends with Jonathan being so anxious about not being able to you know, remove his animal identity seems to me to be very striking indeed. OK, we all know that vampires are terrified of crucifixes. Um, I'm not sure everyone knows why. Uh, but you'll see here, won't you, that, that, that as soon as Jonathan starts to bleed, uh, Dracula uh, jump, jumps on him, can't control himself. And it's only the rosary, it's only the string of beads with the, with the crucifix that actually avoids Jonathan having his blood uh, sucked from him by the vampire. Um, again, we, we talked about Darwin, but it seems to me that um, uh, Stoke has probably been either reading or has heard about Freud and Freud's thinking. I mean, interestingly, three of Stoker's brothers were doctors. So, you know, he has quite a lot of medical know-how um, in, in the novel. Um, uh, for example, there's, there's constant references to blood transfusions, and you may not have been aware that blood transfusions weren't practised in the late 19th century because no one understood the concept of blood types as yet. So blood transfusions have been tried in the early 19th century with disastrous consequences. 
So if you if you get round to reading Dracula over the summer holidays, you'll be aware uh, that when uh, Lucy starts to lose blood because Dracula's drinking it, um, the um, the crew of light, as they're called, Van Helsing, Jonathan Harker, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they start to give Lucy blood. They're engaged in blood transfusions, but blood transfusions weren't being practiced in the late 19th century. And I think Stoker wants you to pay attention to that. You know, the crew of light are actually being a bit reckless, uh, you could argue, in what they're doing. Now, I wanted to go on to, to look at the companion text that we would be uh, looking at. Uh, it's called The Bloody Chamber. Now, The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter is a series of linked short stories okay in fact one of them is about a vampire it's about a reluctant female vampire and uh, yesterday morning i was wondering whether or not i should share that with you okay because on the one hand we've got you know dracula who uh, is not a reluctant vampire you know as soon as he sees jonathan bleeding he can't help himself you know and he jumps on top of jonathan and it's only the fact that jonathan is wearing a rosary that a transylvanian peasant gave him and he embarrassingly accepted that jonathan is saved uh, but i decided to look at this sequence this is from a reworking of little red riding hood um uh we all know or think we know uh, the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Now, from a feminist perspective, um, there are things in Little Red Riding Hood that Angela Carter isn't going to like. Uh, for example, in the original story, Little Red Riding Hood is only saved by a huntsman. Okay, she meets a hunter, and that hunter later saves her. So in, uh, in, in the fairy tale, apparently women are um, uh, helpless and need men to, uh, to, to aid them. Uh, so Angela Carter gets rid of that idea completely. And the other thing she gets rid of is the idea of the werewolf or the wolf as a threat. If you like, in this version, in this 1979 version of uh, the uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood story, um, it's not a wolf, it's a werewolf. Well, that's interesting. And what's even more interesting is the idea that the werewolf represents what we could be. The werewolf, if you like, is not presented as a threat. All right. So in the same way as in Stoker, we've got to get our head around the idea that we might be the vampire. Here, we've got to get our head around the idea that maybe the werewolf represents an individual who has accepted their full dimensions as a human being, who isn't shrinking from their animal identity. Again, you know, I'm going back to Jonathan Harker and his desperate desire to shave. All right. So could I just get you to look at this sequence from the Company of Wolves? All right. And you'll see that it does borrow from the Little Red Riding Hood fairy tale, but takes it in a completely different direction. So just spend again three minutes uh, on this. This is towards the end of the story. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Little Red Riding Hood has got to her grandmother's cottage. Uh, her, she can't see her grandmother uh, for the very good reason that the uh, the, the grandmother has been consumed, uh, but she forms an attachment uh, to the werewolf. And that's not really something that features in the original story, is it? Where the wolf is a, a villainous figure, if you like. So just, just spend three minutes looking at this from the conclusion to The Company of Wolves by Angela Carter.
So, um, this little Red Riding Hood story isn't really like any that you will have read or seen as cartoons uh, when you were children. Um, it's very different, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> one way which, which is different, I think, is the ways in which Carter uses the language of the original fairy tale. We all know, you know, what, what big arms you have, what big teeth you have, etc., etc. We all know that. But rather wonderfully, notice the feminist dimension uh, that's given. Uh, the werewolf says, all the better to eat you with. And then the little Red Riding Hood figure laughs out aloud. She knew she was nobody's meat. And we can see that um, Carter comes from the first full decade of feminism. OK, I mean, I'm aware of the suffragette movement, etc. I'm aware of writers in the 18th century who were starting to develop feminist perspectives. In fact, one of those, of course, is Mary Shelley's mother. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, but her mother, uh, arguably, wrote the first feminist text, The Rights of Women. But Angela Carter belongs to a period, a very exciting period, uh, when feminism really exists as a discourse. Uh, you know, we start to get feminism starts to be used, banded around as a word in the late 1960s. Uh, and then you get some very significant feminist works written in the early 70s. So Angela Carter's read all those. And that leads her to rethink fairy tales. Because, of course, the problem with fairy tales is fairy tales are produced um, to communicate an ideology. OK, that's what Carter's telling us. Um, fairy tales aren't innocent, are they? Uh, if you're reading a story which tells you that a young woman is threatened and her only, uh, the only possibility of her being saved is because of a male figure interposing between her and the wolf, that's not innocent. Uh, you know, that is, that is ideologically uh, sinister, if you like. And so Carter's stories challenge uh, the stories that we grew up reading you know, when we were children or had read to us. And I think that's probably, for me, that really sums up what Carter's up to. Uh, the girl isn't frightened. She bursts out laughing. She's nobody's meat. She strips his clothes off. Interestingly, he stripped hers off. And we might have thought for a moment that we were getting a fairly conventional, you know, sort of situation here. But it's the mutuality that Carter explores here between the young woman removing her clothes or being ordered to remove her clothes by the werewolf and then the werewolf um, having his clothes removed by, um, by Little Red Riding Hood. We're told her in the story that if you burn a werewolf's clothing, then the werewolf remains a werewolf forever. Uh, but apparently in this story, that's not presented as a problem uh, because so far as I can see, the werewolf becomes an image of um, a fully dimensional human being who is acknowledging their desires acknowledging their animal identity okay so what we've got here is the finding of an authentic selfhood okay at the end of the story and i think the key phrase just to just to end on i think the most striking thing uh, in this passage is the reference to the fearful head uh, of the um, the werewolf. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to highlight it in a different colour so it stands out. Um, fearful. It's a very ambiguous word, isn't it? Does it mean, uh, one's, one, the primary meaning, I suppose, when you first read it, is that the werewolf is fearful. Uh, he has a fearful head. But of course, there's a secondary meaning, isn't there, in which the werewolf is himself presented as fearful, perhaps sexually timid, okay, and in such ways does Carter challenge patriarchal ways of looking at the world, you know, in which the man is very experienced and the woman is an innocent. Okay, so that isn't it wonderful how that word fearful is oscillating between the obvious idea, yeah, you know, werewolves are frightening, and the and the less obvious idea that the werewolf might be actually a little timid himself. OK, and those are effects to think about when we're studying uh, the bloody chamber uh, written in 1979. So, as I say, that term is going to be spent uh, looking at Carter, looking at Dracula um, and and also looking at Gothic passages so that by the end of second term, uh, you'll have a real sense of Gothic, you know, from its beginnings in 1764 um, right through to now. 
because you know gothic novels continue to be written uh, it remains an incredibly elastic genre uh, in which the writers keep rethinking uh, the perimeters of gothic uh, what we'd also do in second term is look at the tempest by shakespeare uh, from 1611 uh, the Tempest is Shakespeare's shortest play, which rather suits us if we're trying to get through um, a uh, course uh, inside a year. And, and bear in mind, my aim is always to teach in two terms and then do revision in third term uh, because the exams are creeping ever closer to mid-May. So The Tempest suits us very well because it is Shakespeare's shortest play, but it's also rather wonderful. Um, uh, we'll be looking at it on DVD. There are some fantastic film versions. I'm afraid there aren't many good film versions of Dracula. You'd have thought that we'd be, you know, we, we'd be really well served, to, uh, you know, to look at films where Dracula is concerned. But that isn't the case. With The Tempest, we're luckier. Uh, there are some fantastic DVD versions, and we'd be using that to teach. All right. And I just wanted to share this with you. This is um, pro a sequence featuring Prospero. Prospero is a magician. He got very into magic um, uh, 12 years before, so into magic that he stopped really running the state of Milan. So he was Duke of Milan. Uh, he got he a bit bored with uh, the, the bureaucracy, <laughs> the politics. He got very into magic. Okay. His brother takes over. Uh, and, and though Prospero tries to present his brother as wicked, for having taken over, we might feel that if somebody's not running the state, then someone else has to do so instead. Okay, so notice the subtlety there. You know, uh, Shakespeare shows us that we can read things in different ways. Prosper has a long conversation with Miranda, his daughter, at the beginning of the play, where he really tries to present the brother as a negative figure. But we might feel that Prospero is a negative figure in the sense that he was a neglectful duke uh, and of course, in this period, um, you know, if if in an auto or in an autocratic society, if if the person who is in control isn't doing the job, that spells disaster for the people, doesn't it? Okay. So, Prospero is a magician, as I've said. He's living on a desert island, which is where he ended up, and um, he the people who exiled him, he has through magical means, they've ended up on his island. OK, and Ariel, his spirit, is talking to him about uh, about those things. And I suppose wants a pat on the back. But in this sequence, we realize that Prospero is a harsh taskmaster. And there are more things than uh, that Ariel needs to do. OK, so we begin with a situation where Ariel perhaps feels that he deserves a pat on the back and maybe a bit of a rest because I imagine that even spirits can get tired. Uh, but Prospero is having none of that, and Prospero is insistent that there are more things that Ariel needs to achieve. So again, could I just give you three minutes or so just to look at this argument between a magician and a spirit? Okay, and then we'll talk about what's really going on here. Okay, 
One one exciting uh, thing about the Tempest is that though it seems to be a rather unreal play, doesn't it? In, you know, which we've got a magician and we've got a spirit uh, engaged in an argument in this particular sequence. Um, it's a play that really does have its finger on the pulse of what's going on uh, in the early 17th century. Um, though the island that Prospero is living on can be identified as somewhere between um, Naples and uh, North Africa, Tunis, um, it's obvious that Shakespeare is exploring the settlement of America. And apart from Ariel, who is one of Prospero's servants or slaves, uh, Prospero has another slave called Caliban. Caliban uh, the name is a weird anagram of cannibal, but bear in mind that cannibal did not mean human flesh eater in the 17th century. It just meant native. Okay, so Caliban's living on the island. You know, his his mother landed there. His mother's a witch, Sycorax. Sycorax has died. Prospero's come on the island and has immediately enslaved Caliban. So Shakespeare's play, written in 1611, is asking very awkward questions about slavery about the idea of one person thinking that they can control another or one person thinking that they can come into someone else's uh, country and take over. You know, th th these are issues that are worth raising now, but they are issues that are terribly uh, interesting, I think, in relationship to the settlement of America uh, and the, the ways in which the American natives were treated. So you know, Shakespeare's play has a wonderful double focus. You know, it can engage with the American experience because that is what's happening in the first decade of the 17th century. Uh, but at the same time, the play seems to be set somewhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, and we, you know, some some critics have even felt that we can pinpoint the exact island uh, where the events are taking place. Um, what, what I particularly like in this passage, and again, I'm you know, trying to show you how A-level analysis works, uh, is the fact that Prospero is a magician who is very, very insistent that he is a white magician. He's he's a good magician. You know, his magic is not in any way evil. And you may have noticed in the passage that he tries to see Sycorax as his opposite number. Okay, interestingly, he never met Sycorax. But can you see how, because he never met Sycorax and we never meet Sycorax, we might begin to wonder whether or not Sycorax is actually the opposite of Prospero at all. You know, Prospero is a white man who claims to be practicing white magic. OK, uh, and it's interesting, isn't it, how he wants to see the the Algerian woman, if you like, as a figure of evil. OK, uh, to the extent, for example, that he tries to see her, tries to describe her, doesn't he, in in a way that makes her grotesque physically. She's described as having with age and envy grown into a hoop. Okay, and I think the image there you should have in your mind is perhaps one that you had when you were watching Macbeth, you know, the 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 witches, you know, bent backs, distorted bodies, distorted spirits, that kind of idea. But here's the problem. Sycrax died within 11 year, uh, within 11 or 12 years of landing on the island, and Sycrax came to the island with a child. So the chances of her becoming a distorted being in that period of time is unlikely. Um, I suggest to you that Prospero is needing to demonise Sycrax. He needs, in order to allow him to see himself as a figure of righteousness, he's got to try and demonise Sycorax. So we've got all sorts of interesting issues about race and gender developing here, haven't we? You know, the Algerian woman has to be seen as the black magician to enable the European white man to see himself as a figure of righteousness. You know, really exciting themes developing in a play, uh, you know, written in 1611. Uh, and one thing I wanted to share with you, because I think it's such a wonderful example of Shakespeare's art, is the fact that as we go through this passage, and have the descriptions, you know, the, uh, read about the or hear the descriptions that are made about um, Sycrax. Uh, it must strike us that Sycrax and Prospero feel very similar. Um, uh, uh, Prospero landed on the island with a three-year-old little girl, Miranda. You know, uh, Sycrax landed on the island while she was pregnant. Okay, they both practice magic. 
And strikingly, they have in common a spirit who ironically prosper at one point when he's getting very angry with um, uh, Ariel cause a malignant thing. So note the joke there. Uh, if you call a spirit who serves you a malignant thing, you've inadvertently turned him into a demon. And if Ariel's a demon, then what does that make you as the person who's controlling the demonic figure? It suddenly makes you a black magician rather than a white magician. Okay, so it's, you know, it's a supreme moment of irony. Uh, but I think all the way through this passage, and if you look at it yourself you'll and come to know the play, you'll be struck by the idea that the things that Prospero says about Sycorax are equally applicable to him and that he's trying to present himself positively through presenting Sycorax uh, negatively. Okay, so a very, very interesting sequence indeed. And we've already met Caliban, so we, 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 we know that Prospero is a slave master controlling a spirit Ariel uh, in the same way as he controls Caliban. All right, so very, very interesting sequence. I, I like the fact that he calls him Moody uh, because by calling him Moody, he's implying that the problem's with you. You know, I'm not asking you to do anything that's particularly demanding. The problem is with you. The problem is not with me. Uh, but you, you might be amused by the fact that when Prospero describes the things that Ariel has had to do with him, uh, they might seem to you to be things that would be incredibly demanding. OK, so I've just highlighted this. Thou dost and thinkest it much to tread the ooze of the salt deep, to run upon the sharp wind of the north to do me business in the veins of the earth when it is baked with frost. I think most human beings listening to that speech think, well, that does seem to, deep, seem to be particularly demanding. And so the irony is against Prospero there, isn't it? Prospero is a harsh taskmaster, whether he's dealing with a spirit or whether or not he's dealing with a slave, Caliban. So a really wonderful play there, uh, raising issues about gender, race, colonization, the American experience, you know, real issues, even though it features a magician and a spirit and a lot of magic. Well, after we've completed our coursework, I'm, I'm going back in time here, really, because what I like to do is we do our coursework uh, uh, in the first half of first term. All right. Uh, so we'll be looking at some poems from the anthology I refer to called Witch. Uh, we'll then be comparing Jack's Return Home, a novel written in 1970, to The Homecoming by Harold Pinter. We might have time just to look at a little section from Harold Pinter at the very end of the session. Um, we'll be comparing those two texts together. So that takes us up to half term, and, and over half term, you'd be writing a first draft of your coursework, 2,000 words, comparing um, Jack's Return Home to The Homecoming. Okay. So in the second half, bringing us up to Christmas, in the second half of uh, first term, we'd be comparing The Merchant's Tale uh, by Chaucer, uh, written in the 1390s, to The Duchess of Malfi, which was first performed in 1614. Okay. Now, I, I think some students first, you know, our first perception, I think, of Chaucer is always going to be that he's a very challenging writer because he is writing in Middle English. It's not Old English, it's Middle English. Uh, and I've selected a little sequence here where uh, January, who is a very old man, um, is telling his counsellors that he wants to marry a very young woman. OK, I think he's far too old to get out there and um, check out the women for himself. So he has to rely on his counsellors. But he stipulates in this little sequence, and I've chosen it because I hope it proves that though it was written hundreds of years ago, it is very easy to get a grip on what it means okay and i've found over the last five years that comparing the merchants tale the duchess of malfi is a perfect comparison and contrast to make all right so just just look at this for a couple of minutes um and i'll, I'll translate it for you if need be but i don't you'll need it translated it's my way of trying to prove to you that you know chaucer's chaucer's not writing in a foreign language at all but just bear in mind that here, January is stipulating the kind of woman he wants to marry. OK, and I'd like you to think about one more thing as you read it. 
Later on in the poem, uh, January is betrayed by his young wife, May. May starts an affair with uh, somebody who's closer in age to herself, uh, January's servant, Damien. So I'd like you to think about that while you're reading the six lines that I've selected. OK, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes to look at that. I hope you don't find the language at all forbidding. It's it's quite simple, isn't it? January is saying, but of one thing I warn you, my dear friends, I do not want an old wife at all. She mustn't be more than 20 years old. Bear in mind, January's in his 60s. She mustn't be more than 20. And then he uses um, a culinary um, uh, metaphor, a culinary proverb. It's a proverb that you'd have heard in medieval kitchens. It's not normally used of human beings, but January rather unpleasantly applies it. And he says that you want old fish, but you want young flesh. OK, so you want your fish big. You know, you've got to have an old fish because they've grown to a sufficient size to have some meat on them. But a lot of people in the medieval period would have preferred veal over beef. So it's a culinary proverb which is being misapplied here. Old fish and young flesh, would I have fame? That's what I want. Better, he said, is a pike than a pickerel. A pickerel is a little fish. And better than old beef is tender veal. So I think the language is not forbidding. I think it's easy to get a grip on. And it is quite exciting to be studying a writer who was writing in the, you know, in the late medieval period. But note the irony here. Um, isn't January almost justifying his own adultery? He's insistent that tender veal is better than old beef. And he's insisting on that because he wants a young wife. But here's the problem. May, his young wife, thinks in exactly the same way as he does. The veal, represented by the young servant, is far more attractive than the old beef tough old beef represented by January. Okay, so rather wonderfully in those six lines, May's adultery is justified later on in the poem by the claims that her husband makes that young flesh is more attractive than old flesh. Okay, what a lovely irony for us to consider. Now, we're going to compare, I think I might have to make this the last thing we do, which is a pity because I'd like to share the homecoming with you, but we're going to compare um, The Merchant's Tale to The Duchess of Malfi, written in or first performed in 1614. Um, uh, there are lots of connections. In fact, the passage I've chosen um, perhaps doesn't show the connections particularly well, although I think it's a wonderful sequence. Um, but I suppose it does insofar as what we've got here is Ferdinand. Ferdinand is a duke. Um, his sister is the Duchess of Malfi. His sister's uh, first husband has died. And Ferdinand does not want his sister to marry again. So we got the idea of, you know, men stipulating what women can do, haven't we? You know, I mean, that's that's in, there are many more links than that. <laughs> but, you know, if we're looking at the Chaucer, we've got a specification made by January about what kind of woman he wants. And here we've got a stipulation laid down by Ferdinand, which is I do not want my sister marrying again. And one of the things we need to consider, obviously, studying the Duchess of Malfi is why this is. You know, what is Ferdinand's problem with his sister remarrying? OK, Bossola um, has done time in jail because he worked on behalf of Ferdinand's brother, the cardinal. And I suppose rather sadly, that's what often happens to people coming out of jail. They can't find a legitimate 
a job because no one will employ them because they've just been in jail. The problem exists to this day, doesn't it? And so they find themselves falling back into criminal associations. So that's exactly what's happening with Bossola. He's just been released from jail. He needs money and somebody's offering him a huge amount of money and telling him, in effect, that he doesn't really have to do a lot to earn it. He just needs to spy on the Duchess. So again, can I just give you two minutes to look at this rather wonderful interchange between uh, somebody who's just come out of jail and the Duke of Calabria offering them gold? So, fantastic piece of writing. I, I think you'll agree with me. Um, just a couple of things, because we're running short of time, I know, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, two things, really. One, um, Bossola is wonderfully psychologized, isn't he, here? He's somebody who is troubled to accept the money. Um, he knows, you know, he's worked for these people before. He knows what happens. He knows there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, he knows that if you're given a bag of gold, you've got to cut somebody's throat. You know, he's under no illusions. What a great line that is, don't you think? Whose throat must I cut? But Ferdinand is being very manipulative, isn't he, and implying that you don't really have to do anything to earn this bag of gold. You just have to observe my sister. The problem is, of course, spies don't just observe, do they? There are consequences. They report back. And there may be consequences on what they report back on. And whereas in the original story, because this is a true story, um, there was a Duchess of Malfi. Uh, she married once. Her husband died. Uh, she secretly married her servant. So nice little link here with the merchant's tale, don't you think? The Duchess of Malfi secretly married her servant. They got found out. The Duchess was put to death and her children were murdered. That's what happened uh, in the round about 1513, okay? And almost a uh, 100 years later, Webster tells the story and presents the Duchess as a heroic figure, you know, who has fallen in love and sees no reason why she shouldn't uh, marry uh, the man she's fallen in love with. Now, Webster did something rather interesting to the history books. In the history books, the two brothers think in exactly the same way. They don't want their sister to marry because she is, um, uh, or rather, they don't want her to marry somebody who won't in some way improve their family name. Uh, you know, her first marriage made her Duchess of Malfi. If she marries again, then it's got to be a, 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 a sort of advantageous uh, marriage, an advantageous alliance. What Webster hit upon to make the play more interesting and also because it's boring if two people have the same motivation in a play, isn't it? Is that Ferdinand has incestuous desires for his sister. So Ferdinand's reason for not wanting his sister to marry are completely different from his brother's. His brother would be happy for her to marry as long as he has the say so. But you can see in this sequence, can't you, that Ferdinand does not want her to marry uh, at all. OK, and look at the psychology by which he won't explain. You know, he says, I would not have her marry again. Bossola says, no, sir. And then Ferdinand says, do not ask you the reason, but be satisfied, I say I would not. So you know, hundreds of years before Freud, 
you know, Webster seems to be fascinated by ideas of denial. Ferdinand can never acknowledge what is driving him. And even at the very end of the play, he refuses to acknowledge that he was driven by an incestuous desire for his sister. OK, um, let me see. I'll just point out. Uh, well, I, I, I must point that out. Uh, the word familiar. Uh, a familiar it takes us back to Ariel. A familiar is a demon that takes the shape often of an animal. Uh, and because Webster's plays are set in Italy, and because England was violently anti-Catholic uh, in this period, uh, Webster often uses the language of magic and witchcraft to imply something wicked about Catholic societies. And again, I'm trying to show you there how we often bring in context, uh, you know, when we're discussing literary texts. We need to think about, um, you know, the cultures that produce them. And England in this period was violently anti-Catholic. I just had one last thing to share with you, and I think it's it's the final speech with Bossler where he um, he tries to refuse the money. Uh, and I think, again, there's a lovely subtlety here, isn't there? You know, Bossler isn't just a criminal. Uh, he's being presented as somebody who really would like to go straight, you know, doesn't want to go back into the criminal world uh, that, you know, uh, cost him years in jail. And there's a lovely little pun here. Um, uh, in the uh, 17th century, there was a coin uh, of a particular value. And it had an image of Jacob wrestling with an angel on one side of it. And so people called it an angel. And from that, Webster and other playwrights, of course, can get a wonderful effect, can't they? Because Bossler identifies the coins, not as angels, but as devils, uh, likely to drag him to hell if he accepts the bag of gold that he's given. Um, I'm afraid he does accept the bag of gold and ends up behave, you know, ends up doing terrible things in the service of the brothers. But the play doesn't quite end as you might have expected. In the fifth act, Bossler is so appalled by the things that he's done that he starts to serve the interests of the dead Duchess. And so the play becomes a revenge tragedy in which Bossler seeks vengeance on the two people who forced him to compromise himself morally so terribly. Okay, now I, I'm I'm I, I should should I end there, people? <laughs> should I end there? Can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear me? Uh, hi. Yeah. I, I, do, do you have any questions you want to ask me? No, we don't have. No, you're you're right. I I I, I missed out because I was told that the session should really only run until. Uh, 1050. I've I've missed out a discussion of the Pinter, but I printed it for you, and you might like to look at it. It's a fantastic opening in which there's a wonderful depiction of rivalry between fathers and sons. We can sense that the father's getting weak, the son's getting strong, and that is a problem for Max. After all, Max is a very good name, isn't it? It comes from the Latin meaning great, but it's the fate of all fathers, isn't it, to be strong when their children are young, but to become weaker as their children grow up. And that's what Homecoming is all about. It's a fantastic play. But I, but I hope that gave you a taste for what we do. I, you know, as I said, I wanted to show you the texts and perhaps hope that you would go away over the summer holidays and start looking at them. But at the same time, I wanted to show you some of the, you know, the, the angles and the level of analysis that we engage in. So I hope that's, um, you know, whet your appetite for the course. And I'm hoping to see some of you non-virtually, uh, you know, face to face uh, in September. Uh, I, I, I hope that's that's what happens. Uh, but uh, shall I shall I sign off now? Hi, Richard. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'd like uh, I'd like to ask if anyone has any question. I guess the fact that they've said they don't, but I'd <laughs> like to say thank you. It's been um, a great session. Um, I hope the student has uh, taken some of it from them. Yeah, if there's anything I hope it wasn't too they... bewildering because I was sort of moving from you know text to text to text. But I was just trying to you know show the level, and you know I, I hope you feel that the, the texts that have been described are incredibly exciting. I'm hoping that you you want to go on Amazon immediately and order these texts and start reading them. Okay, that's what I'd want to do because they sound so intriguing. Um, and I do envy people who are making their first contact with these wonderful texts. And you know, I've taught them for years and they still energize me. 
Uh, but, you know, spend a little time over the summer looking at these texts and seeing what you can get out of them. And I have given you my email address at the end of the document. I'm more than happy for you to uh, email me questions, you know, um, perhaps questions about this session, you know, because you may have been a bit embarrassed uh, to, uh, to, to, to speak up. Uh, but um, I, I wish you a lovely summer, uh, you know, happy reading, stay safe. And I, I look forward to seeing, um, you know, as many of you as want uh, in um, in the in September. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, everybody. So uh, and if you like Richard said, you can email him directly or if you have any other question and you want to email us, you can uh, do send an email to international at mpw.ac.uk and yeah. uh, we'll come back to you. Have Excellent. a lovely day, everyone. Have a lovely day. All the best. Bye bye. Great. Thanks. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.